And welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. In this episode, we're going to dive into the topic of the holy habit of purity and fighting the new drug, specifically pornography. Now, uh, some of you may have downloaded a an episode with the same title as what we're talking about here today. Uh, but once we had published that episode, we we thought we had fixed some of the audio issues in it, but it was very jerky cutting out. And I thought this issue was important enough not to just kind of skip over the topic, move on to other recordings, other episodes, uh, but to kind of take a step back and to kind of recreate some of the content that I preached on that particular Sunday morning and also dive a little more deeply into some of the issues going on around the issue of, or some of the developments going on around the issue of, of pornography what's happened historically, and some of the efforts now. And so I wanted to recreate some of that content in this episode. So if, if you struggled through <laughs> listening to the one last week, God bless you. <laughs> this one might be a little easier to, to listen to. Uh, and this does point to one of the distinctives of our podcast. I am a bit of a perfectionist, so these sorts of things really frustrate me. And uh, this was on me, not our engineering team. Michael did everything that he could. Um but this does point to one of our distinctives, and that is I, I don't want to just be a pundit. And there, there certainly is a role for those that, that comment on the news every day. And I do want to bring current events and think through things that are going on. Uh, but I believe what God's called me to, at least in this season, because it certainly is difficult to balance, but to not just be a pundit, but a practitioner. And it's kind of the difference between uh, commenting on the news and making the news, even if it's just kind of in your own sphere of influence. And so what I want to bring to the podcast is not some idea I, I dreamed up while sipping coffee in an office, but while we're actually doing the ministry in the public square, trying to balance uh, the, the importance of evangelism, speaking the truth, doing that in love, uh, also trying to stand up for what's right and, and pushing back against bad ideas that aren't going to lead to flourishing. Uh, so I want to bring those those practices and the things that I'm learning while actually trying to work it out on the podcast here. So just a quick note, especially if you're a new uh, listener, uh, that certainly was frustrating to us. And I thought this was important enough to try to recreate uh, some of the content. So let's dive into this, this holy habit of purity. And if you're watching over on YouTube, I will actually have a PowerPoint uh, if you want to watch the video. And so we've on the podcast and at church, we've been going through this, this series called Holy Habits, uh, looking back at some of the spiritual disciplines. And the, uh, the big idea is, is, are you and your family flourishing? Are you living in victory? And if not, don't just set goals, but actually develop spiritual disciplines, holy habits, if you will, that will lead to the abundant life that God has promised us. And so we've this one, we're talking about purity, uh, the idea of being, being pure, and, and certainly purity reflects on sexual purity. That's one of the, the issues, and we are, we are going there, as I've mentioned that already, so buckle up. Uh, but it also has to do with our words and our motivations, and so God alone is holy, pure, and we should strive to be like Him. As I was reflecting on this topic of the, the holy habit of purity, I was thinking back to just examples in the Christian life of individuals that greatly reflected spiritual discipline. And one of the individuals that sticks out to me is the runner, Olympian, and missionary Eric Liddell. And I have a, a photo of, of the the movie Chariots of Fire. If you've never seen the movie, it's a great film, definitely one worth watching with the family. But this was a young man that was deeply convicted about the Sabbath. And he his conviction was he would not run on a Sunday. He was very fast. In fact, one of the great lines from the movie is, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Uh, so he's called the Flying Scotsman. But his race at the Olympics fell on a Sunday. He declined to run. And the, the movie explores all of that. And he ends up running a different race and, and winning. But that's not really the greatest, even the greatest part of his life, even though Look at how disciplined he was. I mean, he he was willing to set aside a chance at Olympic gold uh, because of his belief about the Sabbath. What are, are we willing to do for that? But then he went on to be a missionary in China. His parents were missionaries there. He went back to minister in China. And when World War, World War II broke out, the Japanese invaded China. If you remember, there are terrible things like the rape of Nanking, etc. And he was placed in a Japanese concentration camp, being a foreigner. And we believe that... at for after his life up until about 2008, that he simply died in the concentration camp from a brain tumor. But when the Chinese were excavating 
for the Beijing Olympics, building some stadiums, they came across some records that showed that Winston Churchill himself, the prime minister of Britain at the time, actually petitioned the Japanese government for his release. And he had a, a wife and young daughters at the time that were, I believe, living in Canada. And, and so Winston Churchill petitioned for his release, and he had an opportunity to leave that concentration camp and to go home to see his family one last time. He knew that he was dying uh, from this brain tumor. And those records that we we found or were found in 2008 showed that he actually gave up that opportunity. And I can't imagine the wrestling in his soul over this issue, wanting to see his family one last time before he went home to heaven. Um, and the records show that he actually gave up that place. The, the Japanese were willing to grant one prisoner a release, and he gave up his his place to a pregnant Chinese woman because he knew that that child would not survive in the conditions of the concentration camp. And so you talk about a, a great man of faith uh, that lived the spiritual disciplines. I've, I certainly can think of, of no one greater than Eric Liddell. And he said uh, something that, that really moved me. And he said this, you will know as much of God and only as much of God as you are willing to put into practice. So I'll say that again. You will know as much of God and only as much of God as you are willing to put into practice. And he certainly put it into practice in his life. Uh, to kind of close that analogy or example, um, the, the Chinese, uh, because of their culture and religion, do not erect many statues. Uh, they they just don't have images maybe other than Mao. Uh, however, in the province that he ministered, uh, the, the Chinese people there recently erected a statue to Eric Liddell. I believe there's a school named after him as well there, and especially in a world where there are increasing tensions between at least the United States and China. Just remarkable uh, to think about his story. And, and so that's the big idea of this entire series, what we're going through. If we're ever going to be good citizens in our communities, we have to start first with our own hearts. We have to be great church members, and, and that's what equips us to be good citizens. And so let's dive into this topic of purity. And while I was, was studying this, just coming back to some pretty basic biblical principles, but it's it's really important to remember as you you go through this, all right, we, we're talking about purity, we want to practice purity in our lives, why would we do that? Well, it's important to remember that God is pure, <laughs> very simply. And Jesus said something that absolutely stuns me, I, and again, you read these passages many times, especially the Beatitude, uh, but this one verse just jumped out at me from Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 8. Jesus says this, blessed are the pure in heart, and you know the rest probably, for they shall see God. And we're reflecting on the Asbury re revival, and I know there's lots of opinions about that, everything that's going on in our communities and society, there's just kind of the spiritual malaise in the United States right now, it seems. I talked to a lot of pastors about that, and a lot of pastors reflect on just kind of spiritual fog or malaise. But don't we truly want to see God move in our our churches and our lives and our ministry. Well, scripture says, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And so we know that God is pure to kind of give a definition to it. Purity is freedom from anything that contaminates. Purity is the quality of being faultless, uncompromised, or unadulterated. For example, pure water is free from any other substances. Pure gold has been refined to such a degree that all dross has been removed, and a pure life is one in which no, in which sin no longer determines our choices and actions. So purity is important to God, who alone is truly pure. And when I was studying this, it, a couple things stuck out to me uh, from the biblical record. When Moses was building the tabernacle, God specified that the lampstand and other items inside the Holy of Holies be made of pure gold, and that's in Exodus 25. The oil used in the tabernacle was to be pure, as was the frankincense, and that's Leviticus 24. The Lord has pure eyes. We learn that in Habakkuk 1.13, and he speaks pure words in Psalm 12.6. More on that in a minute. And in the New Jerusalem... Uh, that city is described as a city of pure gold, as pure as glass, and the river of life is clear, uh, is clear as crystal. And so, so, so many of the analogies or examples, um, symbols that God sets out in Scripture all reflect back on the fact that He is only and wholly pure. Psalm 24, 3-4 is a powerful verse. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. 
So we should be pure because God is pure. God calls us to be holy because he is holy. And in a society that just kind of celebrates um, impurity, even maybe it's in our speech, maybe it's what's on the screens, you know, nothing's clean, nothing's pure, nothing's sacred anymore. We celebrate the obscene. We, we celebrate impurity in a sense. I don't think you have to look too far for examples of that. In, in contrast to that, it's important to remember that God is only and wholly pure. So that leads us to ask questions about, well, all right, how, how do we live this out? God's pure. Then what are some of the areas that we should be pure in? The first one is that we should practice pure words. And I'm going to go through these two, two sections quickly, talk a little bit more about pornography, as I mentioned at the beginning. But this is important, too. I mean, we're we're going to talk about fighting the new drug and the impact in our society. But I, I think this is important as well. And and so God's words are pure, Psalm 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And in Luke 6, 45, Scripture tells us that a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. Evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For out, and here's the important point, out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And I love how Christ Christianity is always going deeper, always pointing us back to the real root of a problem. And so scripture clearly tells us our words should be pure. Now, so someone listening to this may be thinking, well, you're just prudish, you know, you just... Uh, you, you grew up in some, you know, very confined space and there was no cursing, uh, the, you know, there was no foul language and that's just not American society anymore. And I, I do reflect some on this uh, and I, you know, I'm around a lot of people these days and I spent some time as a public defender and it, it did surprise me that you literally could use the F word to form an entire sentence. Like, I didn't know that word could be used as an adverb, an adjective. All right. Um, and so I've again, kind of been out of the Christian bubble a good bit. But it it does burden my heart. Just it, maybe you've seen or, or reflected on this as well, the increasing crassness of our language, and even in uh, children's programming, um, even in some of the teen programs. Of course, our our daughter's now eleven, and and so we want to screen things, and and so we're aware of what entertainment is, and even in in some of the shows, maybe Disney Plus and others, Netflix, etc. Those involving older children teenagers are increasingly filled with cursing and it actually struck me this is i think a fairly recent development of you know they talking like adults and, and so there's certainly a, a crassness in our language and that goes beyond maybe just cursing and so it's just a reflection and a lot of people just kind of shrug that off but let me ask this question i mean as christians uh, should we really just be going along with that? Or should our speech, should our speech be, be pure? Ephesians 4.29 tells us, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So scripture tells us that we're not to have corrupt communication. Now I'll, I'll leave that to your conscience, what specific words you would be using, but I, it does strike me that this is one opportunity for us to be different. Uh, we, it's not like we, we necessarily go around with a big banner uh, on top of our head. Hey, I'm a follower of Jesus that so we necessarily dress in a way that's very specifically different than others. Uh, maybe if you're on a beach or something, maybe that's different. Leave that up to your conscience. But theres I don't know that there's necessarily um, a flag that we wear every day saying, I'm a follower of Jesus. But the way that you talk to other people, the way that you respond in a moment of anger <laughs> and difficulty, you know, maybe that shows where our, our heart is. Uh, and so I, I don't want to spend a ton of time here, but I did, did want to mention it, that our words should be pure. We shouldn't be careless. We shouldn't be unkind. We shouldn't be crass with our words. And I did even want to mention that uh, concerning government officials. Um, there's an American pastime. Uh, we grumble about government. All right, We call government officials names, all these things. And I, I'm not saying that you can't criti criticize, you know, fairly criticize those that are in public office for acts that are unbiblical or unwise. But uh, the scripture tells us in Titus, 
put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Titus 3, 1, to obey magistrates, be ready to every good work. All right, so it says this. Uh, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. The Literally, the next verse says, to speak evil of no man, <laughs> to be not brawlers, or, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Uh, and so I, I think it's something that we should think about. You know, how how pure is our speech? I, I want to dr- dig down into some of the practicalities here uh, in each of these. I heard a pastor recently talk about a 24-hour rule, that if someone comes to him and gossips about another person, he tells the person, you now have 24 hours to come back to me and tell me that you told the other person what you said about them. And if you don't tell them, I'm going to tell them. <laughs> and you know how that might change uh, some of the the culture sometimes in our churches around these things. And, and it's important to ask for forgiveness. This also doesn't mean that, you know, to speak pure words doesn't mean that you don't say hard things uh, because God is wholly pure. There's truth there. Sometimes truth stings, it hurts, it cuts. Um, so it doesn't mean that you you pull back from having truthful but difficult conversations. In fact, it may argue that you actually say those things because to be truly pure— uh, you're, you have to say what is true. Um, so I don't think we should be afraid to have this conversation. So just uh, a reminder, maybe um, a question there for you. And I thought about this myself as a movement of believers. How is our witness in the public square? How is our witness in our homes concerning our words? They should be pure. Next, I'll say uh, we should practice pure motivations. Pure motivations. Scripture tells us, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Scripture tells us, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, glory but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Uh, this is a tough one because our motivations, we, Scripture tells us first Corinthians 13, you can literally be martyred. But if you're not doing it out of a, a true sense of love and charity for others and a love for God, then it's nothing. And so God I think cares perhaps more about our motivations than he does about our actions. At least he cares about our motivations as much as he does our actions. It's not like, oh, just have a pure motivation, don't go do anything. But we're to do things and to serve God out of a pure heart and a pure motivation. So a couple of, of quick ways to measure this that I found helpful is a question, and you have to ask this to yourself and maybe to someone else as well, uh, ask yourself this question slowly. <laughs> Why am I doing this really? Why am I doing this really? Maybe you've decided to serve at church in a ministry, and are, are you doing that of a pure heart for service, or is it because maybe you're on stage and you like the attention? And if you're not careful, every time you get up to serve, maybe that can be a challenge in your heart. So don't want to dissuade people from serving and serving others, and doing things correctly. But Scripture, again, it always comes back to the heart. Do you have a pure heart? Are you serving God for the right reason? And so asking the question, why am I doing this? Really, am I doing it to serve the Lord for His praise, or am I doing this uh, because I think somebody else will notice me or give me praise? That's the wrong reason to do it. A couple other, I think, healthy practices in our lives to routinely serve in some way that is not noticed or receives very little applause. And I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, Representative Houston, who is the Speaker of the Indiana House of Representatives, um, I I heard from his pastor that, uh, you have to understand, Representative Houston, over 100 people, they're helping make the laws of the state of Indiana. He wields a gavel. You know, he brings the gavel down. If somebody's heckling somebody in the gallery, he tells the police, get them out of there. You know, it's a very powerful individual. And a pastor mentioned to me, uh, and again, he's not beating his own drum about this, but his pastor mentioned to me, he serves in kids' ministry. All right, so here he is, Representative Houston, the Speaker of the House, uh, of any, and, it, and he's in kids' ministry. His first name's Todd, so he's like got a name patch, like Todd. And, you know, n- nothing helps, I think, deflate your ego properly and to keep a good perspective of who you are uh, than serving with kids who are like, hey, you, give me more Kool-Aid. <laughs> like just whatever it is. Uh, and so I just thought that was such a, a healthy example of just serving in a way. And I don't get the sense that he did that. So people would notice him, but he just, he loves uh, to serve. And that was a great way to keep good perspective in his life. The other thing that I would might ask you is how do you do 
celebrating other people's success. Uh, and maybe it's in your, your family, maybe it's at your church, maybe in a broader sphere, but when someone else succeeds, are you able to just to celebrate with them? Or are you like, well, I can't wait till they fail. Or you, you glory in somebody failing and their, their dreams burning out. And you're like, well, uh, they failed. And so maybe I'm, I'm okay because I haven't reached my, they, how, how does that serve the Lord? How does that glorify God? And so I think it's an important question to ask ourselves, how are we able to do with celebrating other people? And so again, I wanted to bring up this topic of purity, but it's not just, you know, stop looking at pornography. Uh, I, I think the biblical motivation, it's much stronger than that, is look, God himself is pure. And do we want to see God? You know, Jesus himself says, those that are pure in heart, they will see God. They'll see God move in their lives. So don't we want that? Uh, but I did mention we were going there with some of the, the pure thoughts and the idea of uh, pornography. So number four here is to practice pure thoughts. And I'll, I'll bring up an example I often use with, with students. And, and that is when I'm talking about biblical sexual ethics, I will often say, like, I did not start this conversation. Out of all the topics that I would love to talk to you about today, I, I didn't pick this one. But the example I use is like, all right, so someone here sitting on the front row, if they stood up and said, hey, Josh stole my iPhone. Somebody, Josh stole my phone. And by the way, like a genocide may not be a capital offense, but I'm pretty sure stealing someone's phone is going to be a capital offense in our society. Like you could do anything. Oh, don't take my phone. Uh, death penalty for you. So if somebody's say, standing there, he stole my phone, he stole my phone, he stole my phone, and I'm up there at the podium, and I just say nothing in response, nothing at all. What do people assume? Now, we all know that there is a, a constitutional guarantee that you have the right to silence, but what do most of us assume? You're guilty. So if society is constantly throwing lobbing grenades at the biblical sexual ethic and marriage, as that's prudish and... That's just a killjoy, and it's wrong, and it's hateful, and we're over here at church just kind of going along our merry way. You know, culture's lobbing these grenades as we say nothing about the, the topic that is undermining our efforts to lead people to Christ, to disciple them in the Word. Um, then I think what, what is left for the, the next generation, for people that are, are new in the faith to assume that, oh, well, that must be true. So, Again, I don't raise this issue because this is the only thing I have to talk about. There's a lot to talk about, but it really is a pressing issue that we need to address in our own lives and in our churches for sure. And so I'm talking specifically about the new drug, pornography. There's a great website called Fight the New Drug, uh, which is a, a non-religious, uh, data-driven website, and that's why it can be very effective in advocacy in the public square. As to the harms of pornography... And so just a couple of quick stats. You can take a look at that website if you're interested in, in talking about this in a small group at the church, just raising awareness. Uh, but the top three porn sites receive 5.81 billion website visits per month. There are like 8, 8 billion people on the planet. All right, 5.81 billion website visits. Uh, those sites receive more website traffic than Twitter, Instagram, Netflix, Pinterest, and Zoom combined. And by the way, I'll have some of these stats in the show notes if you want to look at them. Pornography has reached epidemic levels. Approximately 91.5% of men, 60.2% of women report consuming porn in the last month. According to that would be a 2020 study by Solano, Eaton, O'Leary. And this, this one is, is really troubling. Most kids today are exposed to porn by age 13. Um, with about 84.4% of males and 50% of 57% of me, uh, females ages 14 through 18 having reviewed porn. And many times, the first time they see it as at home, and their parents still haven't talked to them about it by the time they're 13, 14. Um, something like, and this is troubling, something like 57% of pastors struggle with pornography and 64% of youth pastors. And we know, and again, why I mentioned this term, fighting the new drug, there is an increasing mountain of data to show that pornography is dangerous. It literally rewires your brain. And so it's not that you're taking in an outside substance like fentanyl, which of course is a, a massive problem in the United States, a dangerous drug. But that looking at these images, it fires off chemicals in our own brain, like dopamine and then cortisol. And it I'm going to try to be delicate here, but I also want to to show you know just how damaging it is. John Stone Street has this great quote. We talk about it from time to time. 
that ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. Um, I'm aware of there's an entire Reddit group, my understanding is, of, of young men on, on Reddit that cannot, again, I'm trying to be delicate, cannot enjoy intimacy, like physical intimacy with a woman, with a real woman, because their their brains are wired to respond to digital stimuli. And so, again, we've, we've handed young men these devices with unfettered access to pornography, like, ah, oh, it's just a guilty pleasure. It's just boys being boys. No, it's like literally rewiring their brain to the point that is affecting them physically and their own marriages. Also, there is a link uh, between pornography and sex trafficking and abuse. And one of the most sobering conversations I ever had uh, was with a detective who has spent his entire career as a detective investigating child sex crimes, specifically internet crimes, uh, child pornography, etc. And he, he told me a story uh, about a grandfather that had molested a grandchild. They're sitting there. He's about to arrest him. And the grandfather's just kind of looking out over the farm. He knows he's going away probably for the rest of his life, having just committed this act. And he just kind of opined, you know, I wish I had never looked at the first magazine, the first pornographic magazine. And this this police officer said that every case that he has 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 followed through, he's made arrests. Those people have been prosecuted that each one of them began with pornography. Now, I'm not saying if you're struggling with that right now, that's exactly where you're going to end up. I'm just saying that there you have to understand there is a clear link between pornography, sex trafficking and abuse. And and then some of the things I just mentioned, it, it also strikes me in our culture that we, we kind of are talking out of both sides of our mouth on this issue, because on one hand, you have the Me Too movement, which says, hey, Hollywood, broader culture, you're not treating women with the full dignity and respect that they deserve. And, you know, amen to the principle that you, we should treat all people with dignity and respect. Um, and and so you, you're probably familiar with that movement. But at the same time, uh, we're also celebrating somebody like Hugh Hefner at Playboy Magazine as a pioneer of the sexual revolution and sexual liberty in, in our society. And like, how can those two ideas exist in, in the same culture? And so I think we've all probably noticed uh, the hypocrisy of sorts in our culture. And and I did want to mention as we we get into this that I do see this as something different than pre pretty much anything in human history. And, and certainly humans have always wrestled with following God's good design when it comes to marriage and, and human sexuality. And and the church's approach to this is to come to it with deep humility, saying, look, we're we're human too. We also wrestle with temptations. We're not saying that we're better than anyone else. We're saying that Jesus has the way at the, to life and to abundance. And if you follow that, you will flourish. And so join us as we work together to, to live out the way of Jesus. But this is something different than, than all of human history. At, at no time in human history have young men, older men, women, um, this is affecting women as well, had such easy, un, unfettered, apparently seemingly anonymous, though it's not, access to pornography. There's never been anything like this. And it is a story of withdrawal. In the 1960s, there was a Protestant film office. There was a Catholic Legion of Decency. Both of those organizations withdrew in about the 1960s. Uh, and I think we all know the rest of the story where uh, where Hollywood has gone. So we, we often kind of you know yell against the darkness, shake our fists at the darkness, but realize that often the story of change in our society is withdrawal. Uh, and that's something for us to, to reflect on and think about as we we uh, strategize and think about things now. So if this is something different than you know all of human history, it probably calls for a different strategy of how to address it. And and then the the last sobering thought, as I have reflected on you know fighting this new drug, is how here's the question: How in the world did a a quote-unquote Christian nation, or at least a nation that was, and we've talked about the, the term Christian nationalism before, but this, a nation that was deeply steeped in Christian morality, and even as late as the 1950s and 1960s, you know, with, with lingering effects even into the last couple decades, that held to a biblical view of marriage and sexuality, how, how is it that within just a decade or two that we flipped our morality? 
that literally what we believe about marriage went from the hard but right choice to now the hateful choice of the hard right. It's, it's kind of how our, our society frames it. How did that happen so quickly? I mean, it literally seems like it was almost overnight. Well, what what if, what if almost 90% of men, 60% of women, including Christians, including non-believers, are looking at a commoditized, cheapened version of what God called a sacred act. And it cheapened and it changed people's views of morality because they had access to something called pornography. Now, I don't know for sure that that is the fact, but how else could a nation's moral position on human sexuality change so radically in such a a, a fa or such a short period of time? Now, maybe it's not the only explanation, but it sure seems to me that it could be a strong reason why this happened. Everybody's just seeing this commoditized, cheap in form of sexuality. Like, oh, well, it, maybe it's really not that important. Why do we have to defend it? It can be anything we say it is. The other question is, where where's the church? Isn't the church the institution that's supposed to stand up and say something about these issues? Well, what if, and again, I say this with all humility, but what if many of our pastors and many of our church leaders and even their wives are also hooked, addicted to this same issue? And how can you stand up against something if you're struggling to overcome it yourself? And there's fear of that being exposed, that sort of thing. And so again, please hear, hear my heart here. No one's immune to this. I'm not immune to this temptation for sure. But what if we, we all lament these really fast changes in our society away from biblical principles? What if there was a fairly simple answer to how and why some of these things change so fast? So that's something I've reflected on. I'll leave that to you that you can mull over it. So I've gone on a little bit just kind of explaining the problem. I think most of us are aware of the problem, but wanted to mention just how pervasive it is. And nobody's talking about it. Like who's standing up to raise the alarm? So in response to this, what do we do as Christians, starting first with our own hearts and lives, moving outward? Uh, the first thing I would say is we're, we're reflecting on how do we have a, a how do we have pure thoughts is that we do need to call it what it is. And, and that is sin. In First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8, this is the will of God, your sanctif sanctification. You abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of us, uh, you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger and all these things. And we hold you, told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And I could go through a host of scriptures. I encourage you, if you're wrestling this area, to, to really... Uh, put a lot of scripture to to memory in this area, but culture basically says, "Look, it's just a guilty pleasure. You're not harming anyone. Uh, it's fine. Um, just you know, don't let it spill out onto the rest of your life." But it can even be a healthy thing for you. Scripture says something very different. Scripture says it's not a guilty pleasure. It is sin. It is sinful. She says, "If a man looks on a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery in his heart." And so the pornography is notoriously difficult to uh, define, but in fact, one Supreme Court justice, he said, I know it when I see it. <laughs> That's how he defined it. Uh, but for our purposes, I'll define pornography, and I would define it this way. And of course, I'll, the caveat is this does not apply to your spouse, of course, but pornography is looking at another person in a state of undress for your sexual gratification. Pornography is looking at another person in a state of undress for your sexual gratification. That's where Jesus draws the line, and that's where I think we have to, to say that's what it is. And understand, this is, it's a sin against God, but why? Why is that an issue? Why does Jesus say this? And in a society where like nobody seems to care, basically what Jesus is saying, I'll speak specifically to men, this can apply to women as well, but Jesus says when you look at a woman, you should not look at her for the purpose of sexual gratification. And he knows that's going to be a temptation of ours. He says, you don't look at her for that reason. When you see a woman 
what you're supposed to do is you're, you are to see her as who she is. She is a daughter of the king. She's an individual made in the image of God. I did not make her so you could lust after her. You are to see her worth and her dignity. And isn't that a beautiful thing? I mean, you think about, oh, this is so repressive and this is so outdated and ancient. Really? I mean, what, what do you think our society needs? Why, why do we have the Me Too movement? Why, why, why are we talking about these things? And Jesus says, no, you, you know, lust and, and sin is, is looking after a woman and lusting after her. Um, long before you get to the act of adultery or fornic fornication, that is the standard. And understand if you're married, this is not just a sin against God. It is a sin against your spouse and something that needs to be confessed. I know there can be a lot of, of, of concern what's going to happen with this, but God wants us to live pure lives, clean lives. Um, we want to be free of, of the burden of sin and to seek and, and find forgiveness. And for that individual to think, well, you know, but it's not hurting anyone else. Really? As, as I've, I've pointed out, Scripture says, first of all, you're sinning against your own soul. And then it's leading to bondage. It's leading to spiritual death, not to life. And so Scripture calls us that. But also we've talked about how it's rewiring your brain. Are you controlling it? Is it controlling you? So, well, I'm not hurting anyone else. Well, you're hurting yourself. That's, that's simply what scripture says. So first, I, I wanted to spend a little time there. Call it what it is. Next, confess your sin and find accountability. Talked about that a little bit already. But scripture tells us, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. For anyone that's, in, that's, that's married, I, I do want to drive this point home just a little bit. My point here is not to, in a sense, shame you. But it, it, we are to call sin, sin. We are to point out just how profound this betrayal is. And so if you're wrestling with this, you have, in a sense, disregarded your marriage vows. You've stated, in essence, that God's good gift to you is not enough. And you have used a, a digital, I'll use the word, a digital harem, because not normally just one, a digital harem of women to satisfy your lust. You've defiled the temple of the Holy Spirit if you're a believer. And so that's that's pretty profound. Now, there is forgiveness for, for the sin, but let's call it what it is. Let's see it for sinfulness, and, and that's what leads to freedom. I, a couple of years ago, I had a chance to attend a small group of, of young men in Iowa. And of course, uh, growing up, we didn't talk much about this topic. And even in a lot of churches now, like if you struggle with the sin, you're, you, you probably don't, you may not feel comfortable going talking to someone else about it. And and so I think a lot of people wrestle and struggle with this sin in silence or in quiet by themselves never getting victory over it. And these young men would come together. They were going through a book by Joe Dallas named Game Plan. And I'll, I actually have a, a photo of that on, on the PowerPoint if you want to see it. And these young men went around the room, and they actually just started confessing one to another how they had done in this area in the past week. And by the way, this was not a, well, it's not a big deal. You're okay. No, I mean, it re recognized the sinfulness of it. And they needed to follow Jesus, but they were able to encourage one an another together. I mentioned this is unlike anything else in all of human history. Like no other generations have had to face the temptation that is faced by men and women today when it comes to pornography. And so how are we going to do? Are, are we going to have a different strategy to effectively deal with this? Well, it struck me while I'm there with this group that that doing this together, having accountability together on this issue is the way forward. Um Another great book on this is called Winning the War in Your Mind by Craig Rochelle. And then uh, Covenant Eyes is an accountability software. Uh, it's actually one that I use. And there are others out there, but I encourage you to try to find accountability. I, I mentioned the website Fight the New Drug, and you can just look that up. There's lots of articles and resources there as well. So I said that, uh, first of all, you know, recognize it's sin, then confess your sin and find accountability. And, and so we have, we have to do that. We want to be pure. But then the last thing is to kind of kill the spider. And there's a great book on this topic. The idea being, if, if you find there's lots of cobwebs in your lives and you're constantly clearing cobwebs, well, it probably makes sense at some point to kill the spider. And, and Jesus again says, you know, whoever looks on a woman to last after her has committed adultery in his heart. My encouragement, if you wrestle with this, or if you're, you're talking to people, counseling people that wrestle with this, is to really try to get to the root of why, why am I doing this? Why do I want to seek this particular pleasure? What, what is this a coping mechanism for? 
And John Mark Comer has this great quote. He says that our our deepest is our our strongest desires. I always get it wrong. I have to okay, here we go. Our strongest desires are not our deepest desires. Meaning that our strongest desires are to to just satisfy the lust of the flesh, the desires of our flesh in the moment. But that's not really our deepest desire. Our deepest desire is to leave a legacy of integrity, isn't it? And to to have a family that respects us, a wife that loves us, and to have victory over this sin, that's really going to be our deepest desire. And so we have to recognize that. And we have to recognize what what is this? Is it that I just I need to pursue other hobbies? Um, that I need to to solve some issues in my my marriage and have to really spend some time dealing with those? Is it that I'm I just have too much free time and I need to find a way to serve. What, what again is the spider? What is the thing that you are trying to um, medicate in a sense with this particular problem that you need to address? You need to find fulfillment in Jesus. And I think that can, can help overcome it. So there's, there's a saying by one of the, the Knights of the Round Table, um, Sir Galahad, it it goes like this. He says, I have the strength of 10 men because my heart is pure. I have the strength of 10 men behind my, because my heart is pure. And in a world given over to impurity that celebrates crassness and sexual desire at every turn, purity can be a superpower. So the question is, do you want to see women for their true worth? If you're a man, if you're a woman, do you want to see men for their true worth? Daughters, sons of the king, fellow image bearers. Do you want to raise strong sons and daughters? Do you want to be a person of integrity, a man of integrity that is ravished? That's a biblical word, ravished by the love of one woman. Do you want to be used by God as a champion for truth in a troubled age? And most importantly, do you want to see God? Well, the greatest battle for your man that you may ever fight is with the dirty heart and lust of the man that looks back at you from the mirror. In his weakness, he would destroy everything, but in Christ's strength, you can be pure. So I want to call us to fight this fight, to fight the new drug. It is, again, unlike anything that, that human beings have really faced in, in all of human history. It's something very novel and new, and just, just the fact that it's everywhere. And so what are we going to do? Um, if you listen to the episode that I, I put out last Friday that then had some, some audio issues, I dug into this a little bit more, but in the United States... Our attempts to ban pornography failed um, in what were called decency laws, primarily because those laws look at adult community standards. Well, where are the adult community standards now? <laughs> um, but there's a new opportunity to, as we're getting more and more data concerning just how harmful this is uh, to the developing brain of young people, really to marriages, to everyone, uh, to go to, to health departments, state health departments, that are already regulating other drugs, raising awareness about other drugs, to begin a campaign of information and, and warning and encouragement to young people to avoid this. Uh, so there's a new front uh, that we can we can pursue. 17 states have already passed resolutions that pornography is a public health crisis. Uh, so the attempts to kind of ban some of that back in the 60s and 70s failed, but there's a new opportunity for us to get out and make a difference. I want to close today with an example. It's an old, older book. It's a classic book, but I really could think of nothing better. And sometimes, you know, we, we look for all the new movies and all these things, but something that's passed the test of time, uh, this is so relevant to our, our times. And I, so I wanted to mention it and it's the, the book, the Scarlet letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And if you're looking at the, at the video, um, the <laughs> Hester Pren, who is the, the woman that is the main character in the story, uh, she was forced to to wear a scarlet A on her chest, sewn into all of her clothes. And I kind of joke with our congregation, that does not mean that she's an Alabama fan, all right? Because this particular iteration, <laughs> it makes it look like she's an Alabama fan. Uh, if you're an Auburn fan, I, I don't know what to tell you at this point, but um, not an Alabama fan. What happened in this story, if you remember, that Hester Pren uh, is in a very, in, in a Puritan town, she becomes pregnant, but for some reason, she will she will never disclose who the father is. And the father is actually the preacher in the town. His name is Arthur Dins uh, Dimsdale, and so Hester is forced to wear this very scarlet, you know, very public letter showing her shame. She gives daughter uh, she gives birth to this beautiful daughter, and her husband come the long estranged husband. His name is uh, Chillingsworth comes back, and he figures out that Arthur Dimsdale, the preacher 
is the father. And of course, here's this preacher. He's, he's the one that's actually on the scaffold at the beginning of the book condemning Hester for an act of adultery when he's the one that participated in it himself. And as the story goes, Arthur, actually his health begins to fail because of the weight of his secret and his secret sin. And the, the, the author uh, goes through the whole story where he just he can't tell anybody. He's concerned he's going to lose his very esteemed position while Hester seems free. And she's found forgiveness, and she get, begins to find a life for herself and her daughter. And the story concludes where um, Arthur finally comes comes clean. He goes up on the scaffold, the same one where he condemned Hester, and he he ends up dying on the scaffold. Before he does, his he the shirt his shirt gets pulled open, and a, a letter A had formed on his chest, actually in his skin. Maybe he had branded it there. And so it's just a remarkable story about secret sin, about the burden of that sin. And there were two quotes from the book that I thought summed this up so well. Actually, I guess three. Um, but the first one was this. If truth were everywhere to be shown, a scarlet letter would blaze forth on many a bosom. Uh, that's the, you know, the older language. But basically the point is, especially when it comes to sexual purity and following Jesus in this area. If the definition of pornography is looking at another person in a state of undress for your sexual gratification, like who can stand, who can say that I've never done that? I've never wrestled with these things. So we, we all should come to this area with deep humility, and we take that as we go into the public square. And then this other quote, No man for any considerable period can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be true. And so I just want to encourage us, if this is something that you've you've wrestled with for some time and haven't gotten victory over, or if there are people that you're ministering to, I, our public witness is at stake. Our personal witness is at stake. We want to see God. We want to see things move in our hearts and lives. And we can't, on one hand, lead and say to the world, hey, follow what the Bible says, but if, if we're not doing it ourselves. But then there's this last beautiful line in the book, and it says this, talking about Hester. She had not known the weight until she felt the freedom. She had not known the weight until she felt the freedom. God wants you to be free. God wants us to be free of sin. He wants us to be living in victory, and he is only in holy, pure and he calls us to it as well. And in a world given to crassness and to evil and to all things purient, how, how do we stand out? How do we show ourselves different than the world? Well, if we live pure lives in our words, our motivation, and in our thoughts, we will stand out. We will be the lights in a dark place. And so I just love that thought. She had not known the weight until she felt the freedom. May we know that freedom ourselves and then may we share it with others. Those are my thoughts on the holy habit of purity. I encourage you to think through these things and to live them out in your life and encourage others to do the same.